We're looking at Psalm 133 as we consider the theme, Who is Anointed? Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, as on Aaron's beard, the oil which ran down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the Jew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for the Lord commanded the blessing there, life forever. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we are grateful once again that we have this opportunity of reading your word, and we ask that it would be planted deep in our hearts because we know how often we can be forgetful, how easily we can be distracted. We can be drawn to secondary issues and we can be drawn away from your word and we ask forgiveness for those of us who are not regularly into the word of the Lord. Give us grace to love your scriptures, the inspired book, and to love the body of Christ, the church, as you love it. We ask this today in the precious name of Christ, amen. Please take your seats. So the question is, who is anointed? And we're going to be looking at that today. Last week, we started looking at Psalm 133, and I pointed out that the superscription reads, a song of ascents of David. And as I mentioned... The psalm was typically sung by those living in Jerusalem who would leave their home and make their way to the place of worship in Jerusalem. Three times a year, everyone was required to go there. First in Shiloh, that's where the tabernacle was, and later on on, the uh, temple was built in Jerusalem. Every Israelite um, was required to go, but not necessarily ready to go, not prepared to go. They would have to leave their livestock, their home, their estate, their servants behind. So it was a bit uh, difficult, to say the least, for people to leave and make a trek that was quite distant. And so David and others composed these psalms, these songs of ascents. Basically, they were sung as they made their way, their way to the temple. And they would sing them weeks before in preparation for that special gathering of God's people in Jerusalem for those special festivals. And it's important, as we saw last week, that when God's people meet, we prepare ourselves. We prepare ourselves during the week and even especially the night before. Preparation is is the key to a successful time together. Because it prepares our hearts, we prepare our minds, we prepare ourselves with confession, with the reading of God's word, we prepare ourselves with songs, we prepare ourselves by meditating on God's goodness, on God's ways. In doing so, we prepare ourselves for the gathering of the saints, confessing all known sins, reading the Psalms, like the one we just read, asking the Holy Spirit to give us a holy anticipation when we come together with God's people. We also saw last week the word behold. It's an interesting word. It's um, a word penned by David, but inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we understand when, for example, John the Baptist said this word behold in speaking <clears throat> about Jesus. In John 1.29, we read, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. That's in John 1, 29. He was saying, fix your gaze on him. Be in awe of this very truth, right? But here, we see the Holy Spirit saying the same thing. Behold, behold God's people. Now, its immediate context is, of course, the people of Israel. But by extension, as many passages of Scripture It applies to the church. So there's an immediate interpretation, God's people Israel, 
And then there's a future interpretation, the church. And what are we to behold? What is so amazing to take note of? Why is the Holy Spirit saying, behold? Well, as we noticed last week, behold, it's composition. It's made of brothers. And we looked at the brotherhood of the saints. Jesus Christ took on flesh and blood and made himself like us because prior to his incarnation and his death, there were no brothers of Christ. Okay, there were the people of God, servants of God, a nation of God, all of this. But he had no brothers. Not even the angels in heaven are his brothers. As some erroneously think that the angels are Jesus' brothers because they say that Jesus is really a created angel, an archangel. But that's not the case. Scripture is very clear about the deity of Christ. So before his incarnation and before his death, Jesus had no brothers. But upon his resurrection, he did. In fact, we can see seven privileges of the brothers of Christ. Seven privileges we as a church have by being brothers of the Lord. First, we are loved by the Father as Christ is loved. Have you ever thought about that? That God the Father loves you, child of God, as he loves his son, Jesus Christ. When you're going through a hard time, when you are struggling, remember this truth. It is so important. In John 17, verse 23, we read, I in them and you in me. These are the words of Jesus. That they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me, and notice, and you loved them just as you loved me. Not one degree less. Here's a second privilege of being a brother of Christ. We can approach the God of this universe and call him Abba, Father. While angels are servants of God, they do not enjoy the intimacy that the redeemed have with God. In Romans 8, 15, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by which we cry out. So when we pray, this is how we pray. Abba, Father. Right? We don't just simply say uh, God. No, there is a word of endearment that has been granted to us. We call him Father. What a privilege. Three, we are co-heirs with Christ, and therefore all that belongs to Christ belongs to us. This is very important. In the Old Testament, you'll notice that there was the firstborn and there were the, his siblings, right? If there, is no, there are no siblings, there is no firstborn. Firstborn of what? You can only call someone firstborn if he has siblings. Otherwise, he's your son. Jesus was always the son of God. But he became the firstborn upon his resurrection. Because then brothers were brought into the family. And as firstborn, Christ gives to us, his brothers, his inheritance. That's where we are, we are called co-heirs. Everything that belongs to Christ is now ours. It doesn't matter our status here on earth. It's ridiculous if we think that what we have here on earth gives us meaning. In fact, if we have fallen for that lie, we, are, we need to repent of that and say, Lord, deliver me from that lie. Deliver me from the seduction of this world. Let me believe the truth that I am a co-heir with you. How remarkable that we are co-heirs with Christ. And then we are seated for, seated in heavenly places with Christ. This speaks of matchless honor. It doesn't matter the position you hold here on earth. What matters is the one you have in Christ. In Ephesians 2 verse 6, God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in 
Christ Jesus. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We walk on this earth, but our position secured by Christ as brothers is one with him. Five, we are connected to one another by a bond that is thicker than blood. My blood siblings are important, but never as important as my siblings in Christ. It is that bond that God secured for us through the death of his son. And then after he resurrected, he said these words to Mary, who was going to relay them to the disciples of Christ. Remember, they had deserted him. They were afraid. They were hiding. And Jesus tells Mary, do not be afraid. Go, bring word to my brothers. Not my disciples, not my followers, my brothers. To leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Six, one day believers will resemble, resemble Christ. Beloved, it says in 1 John 3, 2. Now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. In other words, there is no way we can behold the Lord in his glory unless we are given an incorruptible body with incorruptible eyes that can stand the dazzle of our Lord, the radiancy, the glow, the majesty of our Savior. And with our glorified bodies, we will behold him. But what kind of bodies? We will be like him. Not equal to him, not identical to him. He will stand out, but we are going to be like him and therefore enjoy him forever. And seven, we will reign with him for eternity. In 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. God's people endure. God's people don't fall by the wayside. If we fall, we dust off, we get up. If we fall, we receive an encouragement from a brother, a rebuke if necessary, if there is sin, and we resume our walk with the Lord. We will endure by grace. And after enduring, we reign with him. Before the cross, as I said, Jesus had no brothers. But once the cross was accomplished, the work of redemption was done. He rose from the dead, and Jesus freely calls us his brothers. He's redeemed us. We are no longer slaves of sin, no longer bond, under bondage to death. Then we considered the calling, a unique calling. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to live together in unity. The second reason the Holy Spirit invites us to behold the church is because of the unity, this gift that is ours, the gift that the triune God has given to the church. It is described here as living together. Another version says dwelling together in unity. When we are apart physically, we are still united in him. It is amazing this. This is an amazing truth. But when we come together as a church, right? We don't come to church. We say this as a as, that's part of the lingo that has been adopted over the years. It's the church that comes together in this place dedicated to worship. So we call this a house of worship. We are the church. We are the people of God. When the church comes together, that unity is therefore even more manifest. But when I am apart, separate from you, I am still one with you. I am still one with the church. And wherever we are, we represent our lovely Savior and the church to which I belong. The unity of the Spirit is a gift unlike anything that we can witness here on earth. To see how this unique unity is and how important it is, we need to look at what Jesus said before he died. Notice his words before his crucifixion. 
He didn't pray because he was afraid here in John 17. He didn't pray because he knew there was a, an awful moment of separation from the Father, which is true. That prayer was in the Garden of Gethsemane. But here in John 17, he prays for his disciples. Jesus deliberately prays out loud. And John is the only one who records that prayer. It's in John 17. And what he had on his heart were his disciples. And notice what he says in John 17, verse 11. I am no longer going to be in the world. And yet they themselves are in the world. I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name. The name which you have given me, so that they may be one, just as we are one. Notice how much the Lord desires this unity. He wants a unity that he enjoys to be ours. The unity that, he, the, that is present in the Godhead, right? In the, the three persons in the Godhead. We have a unity that is unique and that is matchless and incomprehensible. Only in eternity we'll begin to understand more this unity of the Trinity. That unity is the gift that the Lord gives to the church. It's remarkable. And he says, this is my desire. So then we are called to be not uniform, not that we are to clone after someone, not that we are to be like someone famous here or celebrity Christian here. We are to simply preserve the unity of the Spirit, as Paul says. The unity that the Holy Spirit has given to each one of us the moment we became true children of God. And it's a unity that is fueled by one thing and one thing alone. It is a unity fueled by the gospel. When I make the gospel my priority, I will be united with my brothers and sisters. When other interests come into play, and no matter what other interests, then I will not be united with my brothers and sisters. They could be noble interests. They could be uh, issues such as justice issues. They can be issues such as uh, gender equality. We may think these are really noble issues, but they are far less important. I could be a slave, right? I could be a slave, and yet in Christ, I am free. And it doesn't matter if Martin Luther King comes in the picture and frees me as a slave or gives, grants me civil rights, or rather Abraham Lincoln and then Martin Luther King. It doesn't matter because those are secondary issues. The primary issue is the gospel. And what has the gospel done? It's made me free, free forever, not for time, free in Christ forever. And because of that freedom, now I enjoy unity with my brothers. That's why there are no slaves or free. There are no Jews or Greeks, Paul says. We are one in Christ. When the gospel is kept at the forefront, the flesh, my flesh, my agenda, my ideas are mortified. The gospel prompts us to put our personal interests on the side, and we all row the boat in the same direction. And the goal is determined by the Holy Spirit. Behold, how beautiful is the church. Notice its composition, brothers. Notice its calling, dwelling together in unity. And then we notice its consecration. Look at verse 2. It's like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard as of Aaron's beard. And that's an interesting simile. Scriptures are full of figures of speech, right? We have uh, hyperboles, we have parables, we have similes. These are all different figures of speech. And so David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, likens the unity of the brothers, which is pleasant and good, to the oil that was poured on Aaron's head. Who is Aaron? He is the high, first high priest of Israel. And it's interesting that David does not 
recollect his personal anointing, right? He could have drawn from his anointing when Samuel came and anointed him king of Israel. Rather, he goes way back to the first instance when Aaron, who was simply a, a Levite, right, is singled out from his brothers and anointed in the presence of all of Israel. And everyone saw this very unique moment when this aromatic oil was, came on Aaron's head and trickled down his beard and down his holy garments, it says. This simile was meant to draw our attention to behold the anointing of the church. So it's used so that the anointing of the church is likened to that experience that Aaron had. Now, when Aaron was anointed, as I said, it was a very fragrant oil that came upon him. And wherever he walked, he brought up with him that fragrance so that people would re re realize Aaron is in our presence. Aaron is just walked around. And that's how the church is meant to be in this world. The fragrance of Christ is to accompany us wherever we are. Why was Aaron anointed? Not simply to bring fragrance, but he was set aside to serve. He was set aside and consecrated to be a high priest of God's people. And all his children, the sons of Aaron, became priests. He was the high priest, and they in turn were the priests. Now, it's interesting. If you look in Leviticus chapter 8, you will notice that this um, image of Aaron being anointed is not described as David describes it here. And David wasn't there. This is hundreds of years earlier. So how could David know that the oil trickled down his beard and then trickled down his garments? Uh, how could he know this? Moses doesn't say it because he was king and had been anointed himself. And as king... When the oil came upon him, it trickled down his beard, and it trickled down his garments. So he just says, if it happened to me, hundreds of years earlier, it must have happened to him. He was anointed as well. And that's what I mean by the fact that the head alone is not anointed, but the entire body is. Not just Christ's head, but the body of Christ as well. And we are that body, the church the body is anointed by the oil. And what does the oil signify? It signifies the Holy Spirit. In Leviticus chapter 8, verse 12, let's read the description given to us by Moses. Then Moses poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. In other words, to place him aside. He would be different from every other Israelite. And just as our Lord is different. Though he is the God man, he's like us, he is consecrated, he is different, and he's uniquely blessed, but he doesn't save the anointing for himself. He doesn't say, I'm anointed and no one else. No, it goes to the entire body. So that the entire body is set aside to serve, set aside to be fragrant, set aside to minister as priests. So therefore, we are bringing the message of the gospel and reconciling sinners to Christ as we preach that gospel. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 and 13, describing the body of Christ here on earth. For just as the body is one, yet has many gifts, many parts rather, and all the parts of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. And for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. That's what happens to believers. We were baptized into the body of Christ. This is the baptism of the spirit. When the spirit of God takes a someone who has been regenerated and includes them into the body, to the mystical body, because it's a body that is not only local, but it's universal. In other words, it's all over this world so that the Holy Spirit brings that individual into this 
this entity called the body of Christ and therefore enjoys that oil, the Holy Spirit, enjoys the fact that he is called to serve many parts, different gifts, but one body. Each believer, valuable member of the body of Christ. There is no such thing as a lone believer. Now, there are believers that uh, have, for one reason or another, um, chosen a, the, a path of being more single, more disconnected, somewhat like a dislocated shoulder. There are believers like a dislocated shoulder. And what do I mean by that? Instead of serving the body and being part of the body, they need attention. They, they are like a dislocated shoulder. And therefore, that entire arm is not functioning as it ought to be. Though it's part of the body, it is not functioning as an anointed member of the body. So how do we come out of that mindset that we are here, that we choose a church, or rather or that we're part of the church, that it's a church that is meant for us, and take the scriptural position, which is, I have been baptized into the body, by the Spirit of the living God, anointed by the Lord to serve, to be a blessing to others, even though I may be weak, and even though I may have my idiosyncrasies. I'm, I'm a body, I'm a, rather, I'm a member of the body, and God has given me a gift, and he has anointed me to serve. How? By remembering Scripture, by going back to God's Word, and by recalling what the Lord has done for us. Christ has one body, and everyone in the body is called to serve, to serve one another. That expression, we're going to be looking at another time, one another, is found throughout Scripture. We are to pray one for another. We are to love one another. We are to serve one another. We are to forgive one another. All that is done in the context of the church. Christ has one body, anointed by the Lord. Secondly, there is not one believer that is more anointed than another believer. This is sometimes the malarkey that comes across on several platforms that there are certain individuals that are more anointed. And so they're the ones that can heal people. They're the ones that can uh, cast out demons and so forth. But Scripture is very clear. All believers are anointed. All believers are priests under the priesthood of Jesus Christ. John reminds us of this when he says in 1 John 2, 27, as for you, the anointing which you received from him remains in you. Notice, the Holy Spirit, the anointing remains in you. You have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, just as it is taught you, remain in him. Does that mean we do not acknowledge the gifts or the ministries that the Lord has given the church? No. For we know that according to Ephesians 5, there are ministries that are given for the edification of the body. But the believer is anointed. And therefore, he can recognize uh, true <coughs> doctrine, true doctrine from heresy, so that he doesn't fall into gross error, so that he's saved from falling into sin because of the anointing that is within him. The Holy Spirit is not for a select few of Christians. The anointing does not belong to some. It is given to all believers so that we all have that blessing, all can serve one another because we've all been baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. And as I said earlier, because of that anointing, we are the fragrance of Christ in this world. As Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, we are the fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. Who is adequate for these things? What is Paul saying here? We have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. We carry that anointing wherever we go. 
wherever we are, the fragrance of Christ is with us. And we share the gospel. We share our lives with others. We share about the goodness of God, the fact that he sent his son to die on the cross, the fact that he became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. We share this wonderful truth that is in Scripture. Now, for those who don't believe, who are dead in their sins, they will continue in that state of death until the time that they'll be judged, therefore future death. But for those who believe in the gospel, they become alive, and therefore they're brought to life, and they go from life to life, eternal life. That is what we do, church. It's a remarkable thing. It's an amazing task that God has assigned to us. The Holy Spirit, therefore, says, Behold the anointed church as she, as she serves the Lord as priests of the great high priest. And secondly, we see its commission. In verse 3 it says, It's like the Jew of Hermon coming down from the mountains of Zion. The Holy Spirit uses another simile here. First, like the anointing oil. Here, like the Jew of Mount Hermon. What does it speak of? The church's influence in the world. Its influence is like the Jew that comes from above. In the Our Father, the prayer that Jesus taught us, we find these words, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is without sin. Earth, there's still the presence of sin. Heaven is glorious. On earth, there's still a lot of ignoble or horrific acts being carried out. Heaven is pure. Earth is impure. And on and on we can go. There is a contrast between heaven and earth. But here's the Lord's Prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How does that happen? Well, it happens because Christ is king. And it's going to happen. It is happening and it will happen to its fullest. When Jesus rose from the dead, just prior to his ascension, he said these words in Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, he says, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I command you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All authority belongs to Christ, all of it. Therefore, he rules not only in heaven, but on earth. However, his rule is not accepted everywhere. It is accepted in one heart, then in another heart, and another heart. And the kingdom of God grows heart by heart, soul by soul, until it fills, until the Lord's rule fills the world. He is not ruler on part, but on the entire earth. And one day, his rule will be made manifest on the entire earth. But now, it's like Jew. Now, the difference between Jew and reign is simple. One is visible, noisy, one is quiet, and imperceptible. Jew is pretty much happens in, in the night, leading to the morning. The Jew of Hermon is interesting. It's very dense. Uh, travelers who travel in those desert areas in the Middle East, when they talk about the Jew of Hermon, they say that when they wake up in their morning and look at, the, at their tents, it's as though there had been a heavy rainfall. That's how thick it is. But yet it was imperceptible. Throughout the night, they heard no drops being hitting against the tent. It was there. And if you look at the church, the church has lasted 2,000 years, not by force, not because we were better than others or sly or there's some strategy. There is no strategy except to love others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how does this church grow? How does the influence fill the earth? It fills the earth quietly imperceptibly, but ever so real, ever 
so inevitably. The Lord himself calls us the salt of the earth. Salt is quiet. He calls us the light of the earth. Again, quiet. Light is quiet. It's not noisy. Now, there are times when the Lord has visited a, a church or a country with his amazing grace and has quickened people in amazing ways. But generally speaking, the church moves quietly, imperceptibly, like the Jew of Hermon, working in the hearts of those who he draws to himself, whom the Lord has foreordained to salvation. So here's what the Holy Spirit says. Behold her composition, brothers in Christ. Behold her calling, dwelling in unity. Behold her consecration, anointed by the Holy Spirit to serve as priests. Behold her commission, quietly but inevitably establishing Christ's rule on the earth. That's why the Holy Spirit says, behold the church. And we need to not only value our Lord and Savior, which believers are, know they are, they are to do. We worship him. We thank him. We praise him. We read his words with gratitude. But there's more. We need to value each other, the church. And we need to pay attention to the Holy Spirit. It says, behold the church. Don't take it for granted. Don't neglect it. Don't look at the church and see its faults. Only. Yes, they're false and they can be handled and they need to be handled with wisdom and grace. But value it as the Holy Spirit, as the Son, and as the Father value the church because it is the fruit of Christ's labor. When Adam was put to sleep and the rib was pulled out from his side, there came a woman out of that experience that became the wife of Adam. And when Christ was put to sleep on the cross, there came from his side his bride, the church. That's who we are, beloved. And we need to give that much importance. And he looks at the church and he calls her and loves her and treats her with great dignity. May we treat each other in the same way because he gives us so much value. May we give value to each other as well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity once again of noticing the importance of the church. We live in a world where the church is ridiculed. It is unimportant and irrelevant, seen as archaic. We thank you because you do not see the church as the world sees the church. And we do not want to embrace the message of this world when it comes to the body of Christ. We want to embrace your word because your words give life. The words of this world are temporal and they only discourage and they only mislead. But your word never misleads. Your word gives us life, strengthens us, and it encourages us. And we thank you for Psalm 133. And how David was used by you, Holy Spirit, to remind us of the importance of the church. May we value this body. May we look at the church, not with the eyes of the world, but through the lens of Scripture, so that our love for God's people would grow. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for allowing us once again to delve into your word in the precious name of Christ. Amen.